Welcome back to DWeb Decoded. I'm your host for today's show, Aaron Stanley. Our special guest today is Greg Sharfstein. Greg is VP of Sales at Picnic, which is one of the major storage providers and builders in the Filecoin ecosystem. In his business development work, Greg has spent a lot of time thinking about and testing different ways of articulating the Filecoin value proposition. So today we discuss Greg's experience on the front lines and how he's learned to talk about this technology to different audience groups and customer segments. Let's kick this thing off. Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Great to be here. Great, great. So to get started, why don't you just give us a bit of background about yourself kind of professionally and then how you got into the, the Filecoin world? Yeah, sure. Excellent question. Um, so um, I am not much of a blockchain person I, on, until now. Uh, I'm a degree in mechanical engineer, and so I spent the first, I guess, 20 years of my career developing scientific instruments. Uh, and so I was very familiar with the, uh, you know, the, the, the world of science and building one of something, which is a unique way to engineer things versus, you know, building an iPhone where you're making millions. And so that's where I started out. And then um, just before I, I hopped into Web3, I was working at Berkeley Lab for the Intellectual Property Office, and so I was assessing inventions, and this, which is a very cool job, by the way, especially at a place like Berkeley Lab. And so, since I was looking at technologies as my as my job, I was like, you know, it's about time I got into blockchain. Um, I had gotten a call from an investor that had mentioned blockchain. He was looking to invest in some green tech that we had, and this was early 2021, which is also was at a really interesting time for you know for blockchain and crypto. Uh, right coming out of the pandemic. Um, I believe that Bitcoin was at an all time high. NFTs were about to explode. And so it was a very exciting time to look at blockchain closely. And as I did, I was like, you know, always looking for what, what are some real use cases for blockchain? Not that NFTs are not real use cases, but I was looking for things that could really like touch the whole world. And so I came upon, um, upon Filecoin and here data storage. I, you know, being from the world of science, I know how important data is and how much data uh, we're producing and how we're as a society, in my opinion, we're in the early stages of really producing data. I was like, wow, this could be a really cool use case for blockchain. And so that got me hooked. Um, I, I, I jumped into the community in October 2021 and then moved over to, to Picnic about a year later and been there ever since and having a blast doing sales, data storage sales. Also, uh, we're expanding our offerings into infrastructure as a service as well because we have a ton of hardware. Um, and just having a blast. So that's that's how I moved from mechanical engineering into into sales and Web3 data storage. Nice, nice, nice. Love your transition. Uh, and I, it's always interesting to see how people, you know, get into this industry, right? Everyone has a very unique sort of trail uh, that they take to get into this particular industry uh, from different backgrounds, et cetera. Um, so you've been involved, you know, over the course of your two years, two plus years in Filecoin land, you've been involved in like a lot of the big, deals that we um that we you know we we that we're securing on the network right now whether it's the uc berkeley whether it's cern whether it's some of these other ones and you've been able to really use kind of your background in science and some of your network um to not only like you, you, you like you know some of these people but you also know how to talk to them and you know the problems that they face and you kind of you, you understand how filecoin can provide a solution um and and that's why that's why i really wanted to have you on the podcast here to just talk a bit more about how not only like how is it that you explain filecoin to these people to these different audiences but then how you really communicate what the what the value proposition is in a way that um that 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 they can really resonate with so i would love to you know just let's maybe kind of fast like rewind maybe two years here when you first came into filecoin land and let's talk through some of just the, the you know the business development efforts that you've been a part of um and just some of these these kind of big ticket names that that uh, are storing data on the network now, you know, largely or at least in part because of some of your work and some of your connections. Cool. Thank you. Um, excellent question. So, yeah, I, I worked at Johns Hopkins University where I got my degrees for about nine years. And then I worked at Berkeley Lab for about five and a half. And so the reason I say that is I had a lot of experience with how like a university and how uh, a national lab does business. Right. It's it's not like you're normal mom and pop business. And so, you know, there are certain things to say, certain things not to say, certain doors to walk into, um, kind of know where the opportunities are, who, um, who can make things happen, you know, inside those walls, because it, it, if you walk into the wrong door, you could just, you know, end up um, uh, at a dead end. And so, and then with all the projects that I worked on, I, I did have the, the honor of working on the James Webb Space Telescope project for a while um, uh, at NASA, at Berkeley Lab. I met a lot of um, very um, exciting people. And, you know, as I started to do discovery work, 
um, in the area of data storage because we were looking for large data sets. I very quickly got to you know high energy physics, which those folks like the CERN people, particle accelerators, they're definitely leading the charge in in, in producing data, right? Um, they're they're dealing um, uh, with petabytes right now when they're worrying about exabytes, right? Not many people um, are in that place, and so when you find people like that, right? This is where the customer segment comes in. I started to learn that these are the folks that have been dealing with large data sets for decades and they have a lot of the pain. And, you know, so back in like 2000, when hard drives were like, you know, roughly 10 gigabytes, if you had several hundred terabytes of data, that was very painful um, to drag that around. And also, you know, don't forget this data is so important to these folks because they're basing PhDs, life works on these data sets. And so their storage and um, accessibility is critical. And so, as I started to meet um, some of these uh, uh, physicists, I started to learn that, wow, these are the people that really need the solution. And they've been working um, on distributed uh, uh, data systems. They've tried almost everything you can imagine. They have some cloud, they have some on-prem, uh, they have some on tape. And so these are the folks that really understand the challenges. And so with them, you know, when you start saying things like, well, Filecoin produces, you know, immutable, um, immutable and constantly verified data, they get that right away. They know how powerful that is. Whereas I think your average, you know, iPhone user, you know, they're, they're not as tuned into how important immutability and verification is. Um, and then as you, as, as they start to kind of like unpeel the, um, uh, uh, the onion, because what always happens in these types of sales is that is the, you know, the picnic, uh, tech team, and let's say the CERN tech team come together and the CERN tech team wants to kick the tires, right? And that's a very important meeting because this is when they're going to see like what's behind the curtain, what's under the hood. Is this like real good technology or is this just like smoke and mirrors? And the really cool thing that we have behind us is this is a really well thought out platform, Filecoin that is. It's a great protocol and we have really good answers to really good questions like from the networking person, from, you know, the security person, the privacy person, right? You can imagine that this team at CERN, they all have their expertise and they're all going to kind of get up and ask their question and if they hear really good responses then you can kind of almost see and a lot of this is happening on zoom you can almost see everyone respond at the same time and you almost see like shoulders relax and people kind of nod their head and and it's like yeah this is this is a real thing this is a really good technology and when you look at blockchain as a pure technology it's great for storing data it's you know it's a great technology for you know verified data um and you know in in filecoin as we all know data is off chain uh the hashes um and verification information are um are on chain and they really like that setup and they see the value and and they have the pain right they have decades of pain which is really what's critical and so when you kind of bring all that together they're like, wow, we need to give this a try. This is new technology. And also a big thing is that people in the university world and the scientific world, they're not afraid of new technology. In fact, they kind of like it. They like being with the first people to try things. And so when you wrap all that together, um, I don't, I'm not going to say it was an easy sale, but um, it was a very logical you know, per, you know, sales process that we went through to get them to try this technology. Got it. Got it. Maybe let's, let's walk through... Maybe we'll just create maybe like a, an anecdotal version of, of one of these meetings, right? Where where you, ha you maybe you're, you're chatting with a, a series of of uh, meet or executives from one of these universities, one of these institutions, and you're kind of walking through what the solution is. And you know, at first they're they're kind of coming into this maybe like blockchain, like what the heck are we going to do with that, right? And maybe kind of walk us through like what are some of these questions that they have that they're prodding you with that you're able to. Um, you know, you're able to provide like, you know, actual, like reasonable answers to about to, to basically describe, you know, the, that value, the value that Falcon brings. Maybe kind of like walk, let's walk through like some of what those questions are that they have. Like what are maybe some of the hardest questions that, or what are those common and maybe maybe what are the most challenging that that uh, questions that you've heard in these settings? Yeah, that that's really interesting. So so one thing that that I would always do is I would always try to take like a blockchain temperature of the person or of the people in the room. Like how, how many of you have heard of blockchain? Um, how many you know, you know, scale of one to 10? Where are you? Like, are you, you know, is it one you don't know how to spell blockchain or is it like a 10 after this call? You're going to trade some crypto, right? You know, um, after the call. And so based on that answer would uh, help me figure out where to start 
with my story? Do I have to like go all the way back to distributed ledger technology and begin talking about ledgers and why they're important? And then how blockchain is, is an example of that and then start from there? Or are they very familiar uh, with blockchain? And I can start with, yeah, you know, this is, you know, a blockchain designed for data storage. And they understand that entirely. So it really depends on who's in the room and what kind of back background they have. Some of the scariest things or most challenging things is when you just have people that just read headlines about Bitcoin and all they know with blockchain is Bitcoin and nothing else. And then, of course, the FTX thing happened and there and then that kind of trumped Bitcoin in a way as far as being the headline thing. And so if you end up with people like that, it, that can be challenging because they are they have dug their heels in that blockchain is is a scam or is not a real thing um and when i get to that i i move to this you know kind of back to okay hey it's just a technology right bitcoin or ftx is are specific things and i and i liken it to like the combustion engine right we all know about the combustion engine and and my story is well if all you've ever seen are lamborghinis and monster trucks you might not think that the combustion engine is a very useful technology. Those are very cool cars and it'd be cool to own one, but you're not going to take it to Trader Joe's every day to buy groceries. But then I right. show you uh, a Honda Accord or a minivan and you're like, oh, okay, I, I can see how that's useful in my day-to-day -day life. And so I would liken Filecoin to kind of more the Honda Accord where it's like data storage. Everyone needs data storage. This is just a really good way to store data. Um, and, and when I give that analogy, that typically brings people around, okay, this is a, a technology. Now let's talk about how the technology can help store data versus what are the headlines about FTX? Right, right. So once you've kind of like thawed people's, uh, maybe negative perceptions a bit, uh, from, you know, just from headlines and, and, and FTX and whatever else, um, once they, once they've kind of gotten back to like, okay, maybe this, maybe I should give this a look. Um, how does the conversation normally proceed from there? Like what, what about this? Are they, um, maybe like, do they find most, when I say this, I mean, just file coins, storing your data on file coin generally. Um, like what about this solution? Do they find like most interesting or, or at what point do they, you kind of see like the light bulbs going off and they're like, Oh wow, this might actually work. Um, yeah, good question. So, um, if the immutability and the verification doesn't do it because that, you know, to someone that really cares about data, just that in itself is like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, uh, other things that we ask that normal, I guess, data owners don't get asked by like an Amazon or a Google is like, well, what locations would you like to store data in? Um, how many different SPs or storage providers would you like to use? Um, things like that, where they're typically not, you know, it's not there, you know, if they want to put data in a certain spot, typically they have to you know, own the hardware or, or set that up themselves. Usually, you know, they aren't asked these um, uh, types of things. So um, the control of the data, right? Like where it goes, where it sits, how many copies, that's all kind of a new thing in a way for them to, uh, uh, to consider. And so I think that they, that they like the fact that, okay, this is, this is really good technology. I got immutable and verified data. And now I have a lot more control of my data. Um, and then, of course, there's that kind of technical close that I talked about before, which is really critical because pretty much the way it works is they have to, you know, let their experts come in and kind of, you know, verify that this is a good thing to get into. And then another thing that I find is then someone on, the, on, on their team would identify like a low risk data set to start with. Right. Because typically in this situation, when it's brand new, they're not going to migrate their whole system into Filecoin. Um, so they're going to pick some low risk data set to give it a try to do like a proof of concept. And that's typically where we start. And so I guess the time that I know that things are going to close is when they start considering, well, where should we start with this? You, and you can almost see when the, the technical questions kind of come to a, come to a stop, they've gotten, you know, um, all their answers, um, that they want for now. And now they're considering where it can be applied, that's a real fun transition in, in the conversation because now we, you know, we get into, okay, what data set, how big, how do we move it? We start to get into like the logistics of storing data, which is a, a very fun time uh, in the sales conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe let's, let's back up a little bit more. I'd like to just kind of talk through a bit more of some of the problem sets that these um, these institutions or these universities or whomever they might be that they face. I mean, you kind of gave a summary of them earlier. And, and I know that we, within the Filecoin world, like we do have a pretty big focus on 
um, you know, just like science and research institutions now, this is kind of our, our I think we, this is where we have the most product market fit. Um, but for maybe just for folks who don't work like on our network growth team every day and intimately understand this stuff, um, I think it'd be helpful maybe for you to explain um, in a bit more detail, like just what are like the problems that these folks face when it comes to the data storage issues? And you mentioned, you know, it's like the immutability and the reliability of the data sets. I mean, these are things that like to the average person, they'd be like, well, like that doesn't mean anything to me. But to these people, it's really important. Right. And then also the cost function as well. Like that's, uh, you know, if you're a research, if you're a nonprofit research institution, you're not going to have, you know, a budget to just store you know, petabytes of data on AWS probably. Right. So, um, and obviously Filecoin at, at the moment has, has, you know, pretty, you know, for, for affordable, uh, uh, solution for that. Uh, so maybe just talk a bit about more about like, what are some of the problems that these types of institutions face that, that like they, they, when they see Filecoin, they're like, oh, wow, like we need to look at this. Yeah. Um, excellent question. So I guess going back to this, like professor at a university, right? So what are his or her, op- you know, um, I guess, uh, what's available for them to store data, right? They can have something in their lab, which they might need, right? They, you know, cause they, they need to be close to where they're taking data. If they're, you know, using a camera or something special, they want something right there to capture the data, right? So they probably have something there. And then they probably in their university, they have their own IT department. And so they're gonna have resources there that they're gonna be encouraged to use. Um, and I think that can be a mixed bag. You can get different, you know, as you go from university to university, you might different, you know, you'll definitely get different levels of IT service. Some IT departments only care about security and therefore they're not a good solution. It's, you know, especially if you, if you're in a very collaborative space in the science world and you want your data to get out to the world, then your IT department is kind of, you know, blocking that in some way. Um, so that's a, that's option number two. And then option number, number three is of course the cloud. Right. So you go to Amazon or Google or, you know, a cloud provider and you can see the the problem already kind of being displayed here is you have one professor and at least three different places to put things. And over the years, you probably tried them all. And now you've got data all over the place and you might not be sure where you have things stored, which can be scary, especially if it's data that's, you know, that's going to be used for experiments or used for people's PhDs or you really rely on it and or things get lost or corrupted. Um, uh, you know, you know, so these, these are the challenges that it's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to put my data. Um, and then you come with a solution where it's like, here, it is the cloud, but we have this very accessible, you know, blockchain data, you know, the Filecoin metadata that you can access every day that's publicly available. Now you can't see the data, but you can check that it's all still there it's all immutable it's all verified nothing's been corrupted nothing's been lost um and if you need it you can access it and that's a critical thing is is the authenticity of the data and the ability to access it like you don't want to download it all to make sure you can get it that would be very expensive but just to know that it's there and also if you've done multiple copies hey i can see all three copies i can see all three are are identical because of of the hashes and in the last hour all three were just verified i'm good you know i can rest easy tonight because i know that and you really you know as much as you'd like to be able to get that from those other three solutions your your, you know your local on-prem your IT department or, you know, Amazon cloud, you know, it's, it's going to be some manual clunky solution. That's not, you know, what Filecoin can do intrinsically. So I think that's really important. Got it. Got it. And then how much does the, the, the ability to, to geographically uh, distribute the data set or copies of the data sets, you know, through your standard fill plus deal, uh, for example, which is what it's like five different copies across three different continents, or I, I forget exactly what, how it is, but but what, I mean, I guess for someone who's not like immersed in the world of data storage, you'd be like, well, why would that even matter? But like for these individuals, how big of a deal is that geographic distribution? Um, it really depends on their use case and mostly like their collaborators. I mean, obviously a lot of them love it because in the world of science, I mean, it's becoming such a smaller world nowadays with, um, you know, bandwidth being more available um, around the world. And so it is, you know, and back to CERN, I mean, I don't, they have thousands of collaborators around the world. I mean, imagine trying to make data sets available and how convenient it would be. It's like, wow, you're, you know, Filecoin or Picnic, your storage plan is five copies. And typically it's five cities, three countries, two continents. 
And so someone like CERN sees that like, oh, that's great. And then you might even get some requests like, hey, can you put one near Amsterdam or can you put one in Australia? You know, we'd love to have one on the East Coast and the West Coast of um, uh, of the U.S. because we have collaborators on, on, on both sides. And and just like with with almost anything, being as close to the to the data as possible is really important. Right. Because of um, bandwidth costs can be very um, uh, extreme. And then the cool thing about what Filecoin can provide is we can show you that, hey, that East Coast and West Coast copies, those are, are identical as per the chain. And we can prove that. And so that's just once again, it's all peace of mind. It's like I can rest easier. I know my data is safe. I know my collaborators can get to it. I'm not, cons you know, I know that these are, are identical copies and everyone's working off the same data. I mean, imagine the nightmare if you had two different copies accidentally and you didn't know and you have two collaborators moving in different directions off two different data sets that should be the same. I mean, that could that could be years of problems right there. So Right, um, right, yeah. It's like somebody forks a Google spreadsheet, right? And then, you know, yep. someone one one person makes their own, another person, you know, goes the opposite direction, all of a sudden you have two completely different data sets here that and neither party knows that that that, that yeah. they're that they're different, right? And you didn't uh, know until sometime in the future where you find out the hard way. Yeah, and it becomes when it becomes a problem, then you have to try yeah. to reverse engineer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I guess one last question, kind of about the sales process, and then I'd like to switch into um, you know some more kind of narrative driven questions here. Um, but as far as like when you're just initially trying to make the conversation with with prospects, like what is your, I mean. I know you kind of know some of these people, like you have, you know, it's already kind of warm relationships with some of these people. But um, how how do you even go about just framing, like, how do you get them to even take an intro call with you to even talk about this? Like, how are you presenting this in a way? You know, I, I mean, is it are you just going on like, hey, we got school blockchain stuff, you should take a look, or is it like, or is it more of like, hey, we've got? I, I mean, how how do you go about framing it in a way that's not like scaring them off with like kind of crazy crypto terminology or whatever? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, typically I would start with just, hey, we're using an, a new technology for data storage and um, this produces uh, immutable and verifiable copies of your data. Um, typically that, you know, talking, you know, because we're typically approaching a technical person first. So that kind of a couple few sentences should should create some traction. Um, if that doesn't, then I guess we could have the wrong person, right? They don't have enough data pain, if you will. Um, to, you know, to say, wow, I, I could see why that would be really useful. Um, but I would say those things uh, 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 to start because, you know, it is early in the ecosystem. You know, we are looking for, you know, whether you can argue that we're looking for innovators or, or early adopters, we're still looking for people like a very small subset of people that want to try a new data storage technology, right? And and so, you know, we are looking for that kind of persona that that has the scar tissue that's been through several battles with data and would recognize, wow, a new data storage technology. Wow, that could be really cool. Oh, immutable and verifiable. Wow, that's interesting. Um, I would love to at how, least how would you, hear a little bit about that. How would you define, you've kind of alluded to this throughout the conversation here, but how would you define that persona? Like what, like who is your, who is like your ideal client or your, your idea, ideal, ideal data client in this scenario that kind of has all those pain points that we've been discussing? Gotcha. What, is that, what so, does that prototype look like? Yeah, so you find them, I mean, definitely in high energy physics and like climate research and like genomics research because they work with very large data sets. But, but this is like, but you find them across the entire spectrum of, um, of science. And, and this is like how you um, actually identify them. So I'll start a sales call and I will not really give my pitch yet. I'll ask them, hey, tell me about, you know, your data and some of the challenges that you're experiencing. And just from that simple kind of prompt, sometimes they'll go into like a 10 to 15 minute rant about how much problems they've had in data. It's like, wow, this is a customer, right? If 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 it's a 30 second response to that, then that's that might not be a customer because it's like, uh, I'm not hearing any pain. I'm not hearing someone that's, you know, lost entire data sets and had to recover or you couldn't recover because there, there wasn't a good backup scheme, things like that. And so, um, it's usually identified in the in the very first minutes of the call with asking them to tell me about their data problems and the response that they give. Um, definitely, that that's the biggest uh, indicator. 
as to how long that answer is, right? <laughs> got it, got it. So like how much pain have they have they actually experienced here? And then sorry, I, I know I, I said I was gonna switch the the framing conversation here, but I keep having more set sales related questions. But like as far as we haven't really talked about cost too much as of yet. Um, and we've talked about a lot of the other kind of data pain points that these folks have been having. I mean, how much is cost an issue for a lot of these people right now? Um, you know, if they're using, or like, or like maybe maybe a way of reframing this would be how much of the of of the attractiveness of the Filecoin solution at this point in time is due to the cost of it's it's you know it's 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 almost essentially free to or you know it's extremely cheap compared to AWS or other solutions to to store our, for archival storage on Filecoin. Um, but how much is the the cost like part of their bucket of you know pain problem pain, data pain problems essentially? Yeah, um, cost is always on on the radar, and and it is usually toward the top of the list. Um, unless someone really got burned in a big way, like they had a breach, or there was just some real catastrophic event where now like cost now has moved down the list because now they got to actually solve a real problem. Um, unless that's the scenario, yeah, cost uh, always comes up. And and I will push back a little bit about the, you know that Filecoin is you know unbelievably cheap data storage. Um, you know, in the early days, we were able to provide it at a very low low price point when the token price was higher and block rewards were were uh, much more of an exciting thing. Now that's not such the case, and so um, and and because of the added compute especially GPUs required to initially store things in Filecoin, um, it, it does have a hard time competing with an Amazon because we haven't, you know, right, once again, it's early in the ecosystem, so we haven't optimized those processes yet, right? So it's still um, a bit clunky and just takes a little bit of effort to get things into Filecoin. And for that reason, uh, the price point isn't going to be among the cheapest out there. And so what we're looking for are, or, or, you know, move price to the side a bit, like who really cares about the verification? I mean, you can't get immutability elsewhere, right? Tape, even like CDs, if you can think back to those. Um, but it's that verification that, you know, that, that publicly verifiable data integrity that we can provide. Um, that's really where, where we're looking to sell. And that's the real benefit that I think, you know, warrants a bit of a premium as far as data storage goes. Um, now, with that same statement, I don't think that all data right now needs that kind of verification. I think it's a subset, right? Um, like the photos of my family trip from last weekend. I don't think I need those to be in Filecoin. Um, but I could imagine that if I was running a business and I had this magic one terabyte of data that was like the root of all my business revenue, and I really care about that, I could see why I really want to pay to put that into, into Filecoin. Um, and then you think about like the Disney's of the world, people that have like petabytes upon petabytes of this amazing revenue generating data that they really care about. This is a great application for Filecoin. And in those scenarios, I don't think that people are thinking about cheapest storage as at the top of their list. So, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is that at this point in time, just given the kind of the economics of the network, uh, cost isn't necessarily our strongest like we're not necessarily like you know just far and away the cheapest option that people have to consider Filecoin, but it's really that verifiability component um, that is really kind of the the key. Um, you know, it's the key. That's that's sort of the narrative. That's like the winning narrative at this point that or the, that 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 we have essentially. And you're looking for clients, data clients, who basically would be willing to pay for that verifiability. And uh, that immutability, essentially, and that that kind of peace of mind of knowing that like this data is like it's not going anywhere, right? Um, so maybe with that Correct. in mind, um, we can kind of transition to the next uh, the next kind of batch of questions here. Um, and I know you've been you've been exploring some new verticals and some new um, area. I mean, we we talked in our, our prep call about about uh, about like kind of the you know the cybersecurity and like the ransomware angle. So Filecoin as being kind of a, a hedge against ransomware attacks, for example. And would love for you to kind of explain some of your thinking behind, um, you know, like how 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 is how does Filecoin uh, how can it be used in this way? Like what's what's the value proposition there? And then you know maybe if we want to drift into some AI uh, use cases, there's a lot of interesting. Um, obviously, you know, go have a whole podcast about that just specifically. But like if we want if you want to just kind of touch on it from a high level or or any other kind of like emerging narratives if you want to call them that. Um, that are kind of expanding off of this verifiability uh, uh, 
uh, point that you were making just now. Yeah, sure. So um, I started looking into cybersecurity insurance um, and ransomware, and, and, and I was reading that premiums are in the last, like since 2021, um, have roughly doubled. And then there's this other calculation called the loss ratio, which is the um, claims paid out plus the administrative overhead to pay those claims all over the premiums. And that number, if you and I had a business in the insurance uh, world, we'd want that number to be close to zero. That number has shot from about 30% up past 60% in the last couple of years as well. So with those two together, so premiums are going way up, but also claims are going way up. Ransomware is still toward the top of the list. Um, of of problems. And then I got to thinking about, okay, well, Filecoin, we can prove that we have three, co let's say three copies of your data in three separate locations under three different SPs, all identical, all 100% verified and in full integrity. And my thinking was, that's got to give peace of mind to somebody. Um, the long-term play there could be maybe we can get into the risk calculation for, um, you know, cybersecurity insurance. And could that actually you know, change the risk calculation and offer lower premiums if you're using Filecoin. I mean, that would be a, an amazing solution right there. Um, a longer term play, because that might take some time to get in with the, um, uh, the insurance companies. But then I was also thinking about, OK, I also learned that if your company has a breach, let's say last year, when you go to re-up your insurance this year, the underwriting process is going to be a lot more severe. They're always going to ask about backups and you might not get the coverage that you can afford. Right. You might, you know, the, or, or mm. maybe I should say, right, right. The coverage you need, maybe you can't afford. Right. Because of, right. Um, of, of this breach. And so for someone like that, what other products out there could you look to to kind of help with your backups? And I could see Filecoin being a great solution. Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner here, we can prove we have your, your copies in these three locations and they're all full integrity. Um, so maybe you can't afford the insurance, but you can afford a, um, a better, you know, archival product. Interesting. So, so, so basically like, okay, if, if I have a breach and I'm hacked and say either I, I lose access to my, my primary data set altogether, like I'm locked out and I need to pay, you know, 50 Bitcoins or something to like get access to my account again, or get access to my data. Like I, I like, instead of having to pay the ransom, I could, I could, you know, take the data that I have stored on Filecoin and basically transfer that and start reusing that data in, in, in lieu of the, the original data that was that was that was frozen or that was hacked is that the idea yeah exactly is that you would use one of the verified copies on filecoin to kind of restore your system and you would tell Got it. you know the ransomware folks you go ahead and we're not going to pay you we're just gonna you know bring up a new system with our archival copy interesting interesting so um so you're seeing you're almost seeing there's an opportunity here um not only to just kind of provide just peace of mind for 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 like businesses that are subject to these types of attacks, um, but you think there's actually a play here, just even within the broader cybersecurity insurance realm, where this this you know having your data stored on Filecoin could potentially be, you know, it's like a you know it's like a good driver discount for your car insurance or something, right? It's like you pay less if you don't if you don't get any accidents for five years, you pay a little bit less, kind of thing. Um, it's like, okay, you're, you're, exactly. you're taking, you're, you're taking extra steps to make sure that your data is, is being, um, uh, being like treated and stored properly. And so we're going to give you a little bit of a discount, even if, you know, even if you did get hacked, like a couple of years ago, like we're going to like, you're, you're kind of going above and beyond to make sure this is taken care of. So we're going to give you a little bit of a discount or something like that. Is that, or Anyway, maybe maybe I'm not understanding this quite correctly, but no, like, no, that's, not that's exactly expert, right. I mean, but... you you would need to have obviously the insurance company and the risk calculation. We need to be on board with that. Um, right. That's why it's a longer term play. But if 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 it was true that storing on Filecoin could change the ri the risk calculation, then then that should result in a lower premium if you're using Filecoin. And so that that would be the long term play. So it is the way you're describing. Um, I, I think we need to you know there's some work that we have to do to get there. But that right, could be right. um, a possibility. And then, I mean, even just with, I mean, I realize this is kind of like a new maybe concept or narrative that you've been you've been working on or testing out. But just kind of curious, as you know, if, as you've been having conversations with just you know people in the marketplace or whatever, like, is this? Do you think that there's a potential product market fit here um, for 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 Filecoin for this particular use case? Does this seem that is this something that people have been you know receptive to, or they, they're like, oh, there might be that might be might be something there, right? 
Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, we, we've had a bunch of conversations with a bunch of different companies that do uh, disaster uh, recovery that are excited um, about Filecoin. Um, and also, I, I've talked to a lot of like cybersecurity um, uh, um, experts. And these, these people are critical because these people, have, you know, they, they consult, they talk to a, a wide range of companies. And so they also collect a lot of the same stories. And one of the stories I've heard is every time you re-up for your cybersecurity insurance, especially if you had a breach, the question is, well, what are you doing for your backups? And if you don't have a good answer for that question, you could imagine that the insurance underwriter might get a little bit concerned. But if you're like, hey, I'm moving to this new platform and blah, 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 and I can show that I have multiple copies, um, you can see that being a very good answer to that question. Um, and then just back to the, the uh, disaster uh, recovery companies, um, they do see it as, as you know, offering an additional storage layer that they can offer to their customers. Um, and I think that would be kind of, um, I think that, there, that that would be a very cool thing to try. Um, like I said before, I don't think all data all the time needs to go in Filecoin, but you can imagine that you can identify some customers that, hey, you want to put a subset of your data in what I'm calling the world's most advanced archival data storage system, which is what I would call Filecoin. And so with a pitch like that, wow, this is the most advanced ar archival system in the world. So yeah, let me let me put you know a few hundred gigabytes in there and see what it's like. Um, cause you know, once again, back to the conversations about the CERNs and the universities is, you know, when they want to try it, they're not going to migrate their whole system there because it's new. They want to try, you know, a low risk piece of data. And so I could see a similar thing happening in the disaster recovery world where, yeah, you find a company that's interested. They put a subset of their data in to try it out. They really like it. They can see their data every day on chain. Right. They can sleep easy at night. And then as as they get used to it, now they're putting more and more data in and they're pulling it out of other archival systems and just focusing on 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 Filecoin. So we um, that's the longer term vision. I mean, right now we're in the early stages where we've identified a few companies that want to try this with us. And so it's going to be a very exciting, I'd say, six to 12 months to see um, how this rolls out. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. I hadn't realized that was in the works until uh, yesterday when we spoke to prepare for this uh, call. So that's a really cool, that is a really cool use case. I mean, it does make sense. Um, and I think, you know, at this, we're kind of at that phase in the, the network's growth where it's like kind of finding these, these, you know, kind of niching down to find these, uh, these areas, these use cases where like there's a, there's a very small subset of customers who are going to be like, wow, that's like, that's super valuable what you're offering, right? I think we're, we're, we're like trying to niche down to find those people right now that are going to be like highly engaged, find this highly valuable, et cetera. Um, yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, maybe, maybe even beyond uh, the cybersecurity angle, are there other kind of, you know, niche down areas that you've been looking at, um, you know, kind of micro, micro, subsets of people or of, of, of entities that you're kind of honing in on and trying to figure out how do we like how do we craft a value proposition like for this particular subset of whatever industry right yeah sure um, um i can think of two um one would be um back to the world of science um and this kind of open science initiative that's going on in our federal government uh there was something called the nelson memorandum that was sent out i believe august of last year which essentially puts all the federal agencies that do R&D, like NIH, NSF, NASA, kind of on alert that, hey, we're going to be, um, I guess, increasing the requirements on data management um, and sharing plans. So anytime anyone applies for a grant with, let's say, NIH, they have to submit what's called a data management and sharing plan, which essentially talks about this is the data that I'm going to produce in my project, and this is what I'm going to do with it. And then when the project's over, this is how I'm going to preserve it. And so these data management and sharing plans have been over over the years not as you know robust as you know the federal government wants, and so they're realizing that they don't know where a lot of their data is, or it's just not well organized. And so the purpose of this Nelson Memorandum was to say, hey, we got to kind of you know get this together. We got to tighten this up a little bit, or quite a bit. And so these agencies have a few years to get their their new um, uh, requirements together. But a lot of this points to the value props of not only Filecoin, but IPFS as well, right? IPFS provides immutable data storage. We don't get the verification there, but we do get the immutability and we get the persistent identifiers, right? The CIDs. And then the CIDs are what's shared between Filecoin and IPFS to so that way we can all authenticate data, a Filecoin being the ar archival layer. And so both those storage layers are great solutions to this problem that you know the Nelson Memorandum has put 
on these federal agencies. And so I could definitely see products being built to help these universities. I mean, you know, there, there are uh, many universities um, in the country that make, you know, you know, that, that pull in eight or nine figures from NIH per year. That's just one agency. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of data. Um, and so to, um, you know, to have a robust solution to store that data, um, you know, we have all the bells and whistles that the scientific world needs. So I could see that being a place just, you know, helping the federal government keep track of all their data. Um, and then one other place um, I would say is in the, in, in the world of compliance. Now compliance is a huge, um, a huge category, but you know, essentially what we can do with Filecoin is we can just through the chain data, we can show that, Hey, this data set has not changed over time. And so I'm actively looking for people that really care about that. And can we even proactively provide that chain data to the auditing agency um, as like a value add for them? So that way, you know, they can see from afar that this business is operating within compliance. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if that's like, like, like where I'm thinking is like pharma or anyone that manufactures something where it goes into a person or it could actually, you know, hurt a person where you can prove that, hey, this thing, when it left my factory, it was fully compliant and I can point, you know, and I can point you to the chain and then I can bring up the data and I can prove it to you a hundred percent. So those are two areas. So, so the federal government and then, you know, compliance and probably like pharma. Yeah, it's interesting. I think with the first one, with the, with the, the federal uh, funding, the federal agencies use case, I mean, obviously um, there's a lot of money that gets distributed through those agencies and, you know, there's, I think, having that kind of that mandate from the government to be, you know, sometimes you need sort of a mandate from from on high to, to, to kind of move some to catalyze some of these things in the right direction. Some of these trends. Right. Where uh, it's not that people didn't take this stuff seriously, but it's like, well, we've got other priorities right now, you know, um, and then you know, having having this edict coming from the government uh, or from NIH or wherever it came from kind of gives a little extra incentive to 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 have a few more conversations and kind of up, up, up this, this question of data integrity, uh, of data custody, data storage, kind of across the, you know, up, up the priority ladder essentially. And then, uh, to the second point, I think it, it kind of reminds me a bit of, of, you know, some of these, you know, supply chain blockchain use cases that we saw, you know, popping up the last like five, six years where, I mean, None of these these things haven't really been terribly successful, unfortunately. But it is. But the, I think the the idea is sound. I just think it didn't really like work in practice for a variety of you know sort of political reasons more than technical reasons, probably. But but this kind of idea of like this having a you know kind of a track and trace system where you can identify, like in the case of pharma, so you could identify you know a drug that's uh, like right when it leaves the manufacturer, uh, and you could trace that all the way to you know the piddle bottle on the shelf of your local pharmacy, essentially, you could be able to identify where that pill, uh, like at any point in that chain, you could identify like where that pill is. So if there's, if there's like a, uh, you know, event of a recall or there's some kind of, you know, side effects or whatever, like you could, you could identify like, okay, which drugs came from that kind of that, that maybe that, that contaminated batch or whatever it might be. Um, and I kind of see um, this. And, Sorry, and actually, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll make a quick comment on the supply chain because I have done some some research there. And and so the feedback that I've gotten is while, yeah, the tech can do it. There's almost no doubt the tech can track something like you're describing there. The challenges um, that I've heard is that it needs to be done all along the path of this drug as it moves out of the factory through the world and wherever it ends up. And the challenge is you don't have like, I guess, technology capable people all along that path, right? It's going to hit some dock somewhere and just there's no internet there or there's not people with computers there or it's a much lower tech system to handle the, um, you know, the import of that package and they just don't have the ability to, you know, keep that traceability going. So anyway, that's just some uh, story that I've heard about some of the challenges there. Yeah, and um, that makes sense. Um, yeah. And, and I think, I think, yeah, trying to get all the stakeholder, like, I mean, a supply chain is kind of like the epitome of a, uh, you know, kind of a decentralized ecosystem in a way, right. Where you have all these kind of, you know, dif differentiated actors that aren't, you know, they're, they may not be like the same company, but they're all kind of working together in an ecosystem and environment, um, you know, motivated by the same incentives of, of basically, you know, getting paid to, to produce and ship products. And, um, 
yeah, so it's kind of the same, same, same sort of, um, I guess, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's a lot of similarities between, I think, what we, what we see kind of in the world of data versus what we were seeing in, with some of these kind of early kind of, you know, uh, blockchain for supply chain type of experiments. But I think, I think the data, especially now, I mean, we don't need to go into, do like a super de- de- you know, deep dive into AI here, but I think, a line, I think there's a lot of questions around um, the integrity of data that's being used, that's being put into these like large language uh, models and some of these image generators. And I think there's just going to be a lot of questions. Uh, there already are a lot of questions around like, where is this data coming from? You know, how are these models being trained? How do we know that the, I mean, even, even like probably like a third of the time I talk to ChatGPT, it's like giving me incorrect information. You know, it's like, where's the data coming from? Like, I have no idea, right? Is this, is this real? Is this fake? Um, so having, having this, this idea of having like a chain of custody of data uh, for uh, that, you know, that can be kind of provably verified over time um, and, and over, you know, wherever it's being stored, having it being, being able to provably verified, I think will be a pretty, a pretty like killer use case for, uh, for Filecoin, hopefully. Uh, I mean, it seems like that's th- that fits within our bread and butter, kind of within, within our, our capabilities. But we'd love kind of your quick thoughts on that. Um, and then we can we can wrap it up here. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, whether it's AI or some other type type of compute function, um, I'm, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but, you know, they're they're relatively similar as far as controlling, like, what what went into the black box and what came out. Um, and how do we verify that chain of custody? And, and even what went in, how do we verify the provenance of that data? Where did that data set originally come from? Um, and so I, I think that Filecoin does provide a lot of nice, nice ways to authenticate and you know, kind of create that provenance and then the chain of custody. I mean, just in the same way that like, there are many ways to verify it's me on my phone. Right. There is, you know, you know, it can recognize my face. There's a fingerprint. Maybe there's a two factor in there somewhere. Um, there's a GPS. Right. You 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 might know where I live or was I on, va- on vacation. You see my 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 plane ticket. So it makes sense that I'm in Hawaii on this date and time. Right. Um, and it's me on my phone. And so in a similar way, I think that and, and these are things I think that need to be figured out. And we're working toward this is how do we authenticate that data coming into the network? So we know the source of the data. Right. And now it's in and now it's got that persistent um, identifier. It's got that hash. It's being verified. Now we know. And now we know anything that's done with that. Now we can track. I won't say very easily, but through the chain and through the IDs, we can track that. So we know that what's going in the AI black box is this authenticated piece of data. And so we know that what comes out, at least this is a legitimate use of, of that data. And, you know, is there a way that we can even, you know, ID the black box, the AI black box? Can we, you know, put an ID on that and authenticate that? So that way we know that someone didn't accidentally switch it out with the, you know, kind of um, with, um, the one that does the bad thing, right? Someone went out and switched out the AI, you know, you know, the AI code, and now it's bad code, right? And so you can imagine that we got to work on both sides of that. So the data going, you know, so authenticating uh, the data going into the AI model, making sure the AI, the AI model itself has not been corrupted or changed. Um, and I think there's a lot of work there. What I'm describing, um, this is not easy. Um, it's kind of simple to describe, I guess. But um, I, I could see that really. I don't say completely solving the problem, but getting to a point where you would not have access to CIDs of data that was like not authenticated, like it just wouldn't be available uh, to you. So the only things that you'd be able to see would be kind of like pure uses of AI and you should be able to trace it back to the pre AI data. And you should be able to say, Hey, that data came in, that came from a trustable source. And so that whole chain of the data coming into the network, AI working on it, and then now some output, I can see the whole thing and it's transparent and I, and you know, and it's all verifiable. So I, I think that can, that's a solution that, that we're all working on. I think it's going to take a bit to get there, but that's all possible with Filecoin technology. Great, great. Yeah, and I take your point about. I mean, this is this, is, but the kind of the garbage in, garbage out question, right? Where if you're, you know, we can we can put all this data in, but if we have no idea of like understanding if it's if it's like real or not, you know, before it goes in, that's not really going to do much good on the other side, right? So it's really a question of, you know, are we able to verify that you know that that picture or that video is a real thing that 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 was that was that that the, that that was being funneled into this model. And um, and if, if Filecoin and the, and, and the CIDs can can you know be used to verify that that it's at least like you may not like you know 
at least it's a real image that like somebody took with their phone. It's not just like an AI generated, you know, uh, you know, mid journey uh, picture or something. Uh, or it's not a, it's not a, you know, an AI generated video that, that was edited or didn't, you know, it didn't happen or whatever. So anyway, there's, there's going to be a world of, of, I think, interesting conversations and use cases around this specific topic um, that, well, I'm sure we'll be digging into on, on future podcasts. Cause I do think it's a, it's a quite interesting narrative and, I, and it, it's, you know, I, I feel, I almost feel like in a, in a, in an age when now when, I think people are having a lot of introspection on like, does Web three and crypto have any sort of real valid use cases? I, like, I think that like, you know, the light bulb is kind of going off in my my mind. I'm like, all right, I see how like what we've built here with Filecoin can really solve some of these problems around, like in a world where data is just Thanks everywhere. Um, anyway, so, but would love to uh, we're about out of time here. But would love to just kind of get some final thoughts from you and uh, maybe tell us where people can get in touch with you if they uh, want to want to talk more or have questions. Yeah, sure. So, um, I guess uh, my conclusion is like like I love what Filecoin and Protocol Labs and Filecoin Foundation are are, are doing. I'm I'm a big fan. Um, I love putting things out into the world that make the world better. I think that's what what we're trying to do. So I'm really excited to be part of this mission. Um, I think blockchain is a great technology and I think Filecoin's implementation of it is done very well. And I think it's part of the solution. I, I think that there's gonna be a portfolio of technologies that's gonna help solve our data problems, right? Cause we all have, have data problems. Think every app on your phone is a potential data problem, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think it's going to be a portfolio of technologies. I, I think it's going to take some time. I mean, it took took us what I mean, Web Web 2 has been going on for about 20 years, just over 20 years. And so it's pretty mature right now. And so I, I think blockchain um, and these other technologies that maybe I don't know about yet that are going to help solve this problem. I mean, I think it's going to take us 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but um, I definitely see a path to it. Um, and I'm just really excited to be kind of on that mission. And, you know, kind of one of the legacies I want to leave is, you know, I did some work that helped like the younger generations like sure up their um, uh, their data problems. And what I really see happening back to the scientific world is accelerating the rate of um, of innovation in the world of science. I really see us being able uh, uh, to do that, which would have a huge uh, impact on the world. Um, and then as far as where to reach me, um, so um, I'm, I'm not on Twitter, but definitely LinkedIn, Greg Sharfstein, or just Greg at picnic.com. So G-R-E-G-G -G at P-I-K-N-I-K.com. Uh, happy to chat about any and all things. So please reach out. Great, great. Uh, well, Greg, thank you so much for your time. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening to DWeb Decoded. And we'll be back soon with another great episode.